Hello, hello, and welcome back to the RimWorld Gun Empire series, where, at the moment, my friends, we are not actually wheeling and dealing weapons, no, we are actually planting some daylilies and taking a bit of a nap. But fear ye not, my friends, that is all about to change. We're about to get back into business per usual. Starting off, we're gonna have Richard here begin making some more modification kits, as we did last episode, because we know that they sell for some good money. Specifically, we're making rocket platform modification kits, for vehicles and we're actually going to be specifically trading with United Rebel Forces this episode because as many of you have been pointing out I've been trading a bit too much with the Marshall Service causing the local rebels to be a bit underwhelming. But while Richard is restocking our products, we actually ended up receiving communication via radio by someone named Kirkos. Kirkos here is actually being held hostage by the Confederacy of Bana in a nearby area. They stated that if we came to rescue them, they would actually join us here, and we hate the Confederacy of Bana, and we're also looking for more help, so we decided to accept. This would be the perfect job for our mercenaries. We decided to send out Shinichi, Ruland, as well as Otto. All three of them would gather up into the Sand Viper and head out on this journey to save the prisoner. We would of course have to be quite cautious as there could be an ambush around any corner. The desert is notorious for ambushes by scavengers and local tribes. However, it was nice to take the Sand Viper out around the area here on the road patrolling to show our dominance over the area and just flex our muscles a bit. By nightfall, we had finally arrived at the prison camp and there were no enemies in sight, which is never a good sign, of course. That may sound foolish to you, but if there are no enemies in sight, that means there are indeed enemies out of sight, possibly hiding among the dunes of the desert. Or in the blackest of shadows where the moon's light has not yet reached. Reluctantly, we slowly crept forward in the sand viper, eyes peeled, forever aware of our surroundings. However, in front of us, we began to see the shadows shift just above the sand. Turns out there were enemies here, and the bastards seem to have planned this from the get-go. These enemies, in particular, are part of a tribe that is one of the many tribes that make up the Confederacy of Bana, an ancient tribe of sorts that actually makes its armor out of the corpses and armors of mega spiders. This is a Thrombolian death squad. Even with today's modernized weapons, their armor is still extremely hard to break through. Just imagine how it was for us when we first seen them back in ye olden times of the alcohol empire. We didn't have these fancy schmancy APC vehicles to run them over or any machine guns assault rifles, we had to throw some dynamite and hope to god they died. Luckily that's not an issue for our mercenaries here though, Shinichi behind the wheel would begin chasing them down as fast as possible trying to run them over, as Otto was also manning the gun up top trying to fire at them and mow them down. And so he did, eventually we had defeated all of the death squad. The only thing left to do now though was clear the area, ensure there were no more enemies, and then send Shinichi in as the leader of the mercenaries to greet the prisoner and to see if they would like some help, uh, to which of course he did and they accepted. I for one believe that Kirkos here will make a wonderful addition to the gun empire, but first we're going to have to get them back home, so we began heading back. And in the meantime, while we've been gone, looks like Richard has been hard at work. I see several modification kits as well as many pre-charged turrets. I think that this will be a splendid addition to the Rebels arsenal, as well as a splendid bit of silver in our pockets. Now, I did want to take a moment to kind of expand as to why I plan on only trading with the Rebels, or at least mainly only trading with the Rebels, for a good period of time. A lot of you guys have brought it up in the comments, and of course we had a poll on the channel recently where the majority of you guys said that the Rebels are going to lose this war. Well, we just can't allow that, because if the Rebels lose the war, then there's not going to be a war, then there's not going to be a need for weapons and we're not gonna make any money. Not to mention the fact that if they're not fighting with each other they very well may turn their sights on a small little gun empire here in the desert where there's a lot of crime and slavery and other horrible things going on. In the meantime however it would appear that we finally recruited the impid known as Min into our ranks. We immediately sent her into our production room where she would equip an assault rifle and a massive concrete warhammer along with her old bandit gang flak jacket that she was wearing when we captured her. Now she of course has her alliances set with us, but we didn't have any other armor for her at this time. If memory serves, she has a really good melee skill, so once we get her some armor that can actually sustain damage, we'll probably have her be our melee horse. Most of our mercenaries are pretty versatile though in combat. Uh, some time later, Downs finally ended up researching
using geothermal power, which was absolutely amazing. This is going to be uninterrupted power from the geysers of Dagum. We immediately tore down our filthy old wind turbines that we're no longer going to need, as the geothermal generator is so much more reliable. Uh, we did still keep our solar panels, of course, though, just in case something happens to our geothermal power during a battle or something along those lines. It's always good to have a backup plan in case things go south, even if that backup plan requires the sunlight. A little bit later into the night, we could see the Sand Viper arriving in the distance. Finally, our mercenaries were back home. And of course, along with them was our new friend. Now, one might imagine that the Sand Viper was quite damaged from having to run over all those Thromboians in their massive insectoid armor, so we had men begin repairing it, as well as scraping and washing all of the blood, guts, and brain matter off of it. I almost forgot to mention as well, we actually took one of those Thromboians from the Death Squad hostage by the name of Fox, and we would actually end up recruiting them into our ranks so that they could become a mercenary, joining yet another Death Squad, but this time it's ours. We would also end up doing the same with Kirkos, who only had a four in melee and shooting, so we ended up giving her a knife and a Glock pistol, as well as letting her equip a flak jacket. She sat down in the dining room enjoying a meal while Downs downed a fat blunt, just getting to know each other, I suppose. Some time later, we ended up having some thrumbos enter the area. You know thrumbos, the massive, mystical, almost deity-like beasts that are worshipped by many of the tribes of this planet, considered sacred and have a very, very strong connection to the planet itself. Yeah, well, anyway, so I started blasting. We just started shooting the absolute shit out of this giant-ass creature because we really wanted its horn to sell for components and fuel and other things like that that we needed, and of course we wanted to cut it up and eat it, so there's that. Not to mention the fact that its fur also goes for a pretty penny, so we could sell that, and you know, I mean, I also kind of wanted to do it just to do it, to see how strong our people really were as a combined force. Turns out, as a combined force of massive bullet barrage, they were pretty strong. Ah, I truly love the desert. One day you're getting burnt to death by a thousand-year-old mech, and the next you're eating some thromboian steaks. Or, if you're like Richard here, you're finishing up the supply drop that we're going to provide to the rebels for a little bit of moolah in our pockets. Of course, we're going to need to load all of this up into the rifle runner and set out to go about trading with them. Hopefully, this is the beginning of what will begin changing the tide of war, or at the very least, the local battles around us. This first trip, as well as many, many more, I'm sure. There was one slight hiccup, though, as Scott was leaving in the truck... He kinda sorta accidentally ran over two boomalopes that exploded right on the rifle runner, which caused the fuel tank to tear up, and then we were leaking fuel everywhere, and he broke down. Yeah. I suppose he's become so accustomed to running over scavengers and tribes people and any other person that really he comes into contact with, he just assumed he could run over anything without any consequences. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and we had to repair the truck before he could leave. Which sounds much easier than it actually actually was, for whatever reason, pawns tend to repair the truck for a little bit, and this happens with all vehicles from what I can tell, they'll repair it for a little bit and then they'll run off. I assume maybe they fully repair one component and then leave because that is finished? I, I don't know. Either way, by morning we have finally fully repaired the truck and now we have some boomalope meat just before we headed out to do some trading. As Scott was making his way to the Rebel settlement, I did notice that just west of our base was yet another faction bombardment. With this area here being the only split between the mountains where the two factions can actually travel, especially with our new road, it does make sense that it's uh, quite the hotbed, if you will, for these battles. After finally arriving, we would end up selling all of our pre-charged turrets, as well as the modification kits, and a few scrap guns here and there that we actually had, and of course we ended up buying our standard of chem fuel as well as components to continue our production. Some time later, I decided that we would begin research on EN. NIAC, which is basically some early industrial era electronics uh, for computers, things like that. Essentially what this is going to do is allow us to create a radio transmission station as well as an antenna. As Downs was working on that, about a day or so later, late at night, we heard the brakes of the rifle runner screeching as it entered the garage. It was Scott and Ruland, and they had finally returned home with many of the things that they had traded for, such as silver, components, and fuel. Now that we finally have a lot of silver, though, something I like to do 
in these Empire series is build a safe or a bank or something like that where we can actually keep all of it. So that's exactly what I decided to do here. We would end up mining out a new section of the mountain. This is going to be very small and compact with really just enough room for several different shelves where we can actually put our riches like silver, jade, and gold. Now I ended up using the very big shelves here which were kind of resource expensive but it was down between them and the pallets and they held a lot more than pallets so I ended up going with them. I also of course threw in several small shelves just for good measure of course and later on if we were to need to expand this we have plenty of room to do so but as you can see this works perfectly for all the riches that we currently have. A more than mighty fine space for all of our blood money. Now with the research completed for basic computer parts and radio towers and everything else that we have worked on there uh, we are now working on microelectronics which will not specifically give us anything that we really care about but it is a prerequisite for many other types of research that we need to do. After that we decided to take some time and just let everyone begin smoothing some walls and floors in the hallway as well as in the two new bedrooms for our newest recruits into our mercenaries. We want to ensure that their bedrooms are extremely comfortable and extremely beautiful. Call me crazy but I always find it's best that all the people that you hire and keep around with the guns you want to keep them happy you know. Speaking of I think something that would really make Downs happy as well as everyone else is her very own personal lab. Preferably a new one that is much larger and that is not right next to the dining room. That way they're not stepping on her research papers that blow out into the hallway and you know all that stuff that's already happening. This will be a bit of a win-win situation not only for Downs but for everyone else as well. Now I also wanted to build a much larger lab that way we have more room for uh, new production areas and whatnot that we plan on adding in there. And at some point you know I really want this to be the place that nuclear bombs and things like that are invented. At, and we don't want some little shabby drab shack lab to be the place that that kind of great technology is created at. One of the first new types of technology that we've recently researched that we're going to be adding to her laboratory is a radio terminal. This will actually be a form of communication room as well. Uh, outside we would also then begin building a massive antenna so that we could receive radio broadcast and communicate with the other factions. Just as well of course as chime in to their propaganda radio stations to see if we hear any interesting news that might help us with our product creation or sales tactics. I also felt that Down's new lab would be the perfect place for us to put these ancient thromboian corpses, the ancient mechaniters or mech lords, whatever they're called, in her lab. Of course, that way she can research them, dissect them, whatever disgusting things she wants to do. And of course, that does mean that her old research room, her old laboratory, I suppose you could call it, it's more like a broom closet, is now free and empty. So we would actually end up using it as a battery room. Uh, we can always end up expanding it in the future if we would like as well. For much larger batteries, which in the very near future is most likely going to become a need instead of a want as we continue growing the base. And of course it was around this time that we had Richard commissioned to build a few more rocket platform modification kits so that we could take them back to the rebel settlement nearby and begin selling more of those. Unfortunately though this was interrupted. It would appear that the gang and or mafia from last episode that Scott owes a lot of money to has returned and with them they have brought a light infantry tank that appears to probably have been stolen or scavenged from the marshal service. Okay, I would be lying to you if I said that I wasn't afraid. I'm actually kind of scared for multiple reasons. One, we've never had to take on rebel or marshal tech up until this point, and I don't really know if we're ready for that. But also, two, how much money could Scott really owe these people that they would be sending a literal tank after us? Ah, just a teeny tiny bit concerning. But before we actually begin this battle, last episode I asked you guys to give me some names for this gang and we actually have a comment here by our good friend Jar Aki. I apologize I probably butchered your name but you stated that we should name the mafia the Mountain Devil Mafia MDM for short and I absolutely love it. It seems pretty fitting as well since the majority of their forces seem to be impid so thank you ever so much for that and thank you to everyone who left a comment. But now getting back into the extremely hellishly dangerous situation that we find ourselves in. Originally I was going to have most of our forces 
try and engage their forces that are on foot and just basically fight them like that and we would have the sand viper come around from the side and engage the tank but because the sand viper's armor is very light a direct shot from that tank would almost definitely kill everyone inside instead i decided to opt for scrambling our forces across the battlefield trying to focus on their footmen killing several of them up until the point that they had fled the tank had not even attacked any of our people at this point it had mostly focused on our turrets which sounds good you would think with them fleeing it would leave but no it decided to try and run right through our base right where all of our soldiers were meaning that we had to scramble to try and hide and get away from it scott was too injured to run so he would shoot it with an anti-armor rocket launcher which did damage it but did not stop it we were beginning to get the upper hand on the giant beast but unfortunately not before it would kill Roz with a direct shot from its main cannon if only we had managed to destroy it a few seconds sooner literally a few seconds sooner and Roz would still be alive or even a movement in the correct direction away from where it was shooting but unfortunately that is not what happened the only good that came out of our victory other than the rest of our mercenaries and whatnot not dying was the fact that the vehicle itself actually had plenty of steel as well as plasteel once being destroyed which is the least that they can do for us especially since we do need a lot of resources for a lot of the weapons and whatnot we're making here of course obviously though that does not negate nor justify the massive sacrifice that Roz had to make today we dug a shallow grave in the stony soil near our solar panel farm for him Though he hadn't been with us since the beginning, he had become an important member of the team, a beloved member of the team. So of course, it's not shocking, I'm sure, to imagine that the funeral was heartwarming for everyone. The plus eight move buff we received from the heartwarming funeral does not completely heal the wound caused by his death, but it does make it hurt a little bit less. Now, of course, the death of Roz was still heavy on my mind, but I did realize that the battle had taken Scott's suit from him. Now, I thought about buying or making him another. Of course, we'd have to research those types of suits, but I may end up just giving him some metal armor, something of a Mad Max Warlord vibe. It seems fitting with what's been going on. Besides, we've been peddling weapons for quite some time now. I'm fairly sure that Scott is well known. And at this point, I highly doubt any potential customers are going to worry about how dapper he looks in some type of suit. Wearing our products, such as metal armor and whatnot, may be the best option. For protection, but also for showmanship, I would say. Regardless of Scott's attire, though, as he's out trading with the rebels once more and arming them, we ended up recruiting Fox, the Thromboian, who was actually part of the Death Squad earlier on in the video. As you can see, he's a quick sleeper, a fast learner, and has some generally decent skill sets, of course, but he is butt naked, so we had Richard here go about making him some clothing as well as some bandanas for all of our mercenaries once more. He quickly put on his clothing and then we had him go into the production area and begin equipping some weapons as well. Nothing too fancy of course, we just gave him the standard assault rifle and we actually ended up giving him a plasteel bowie knife that I believe one of the martial soldiers dropped last episode. I ended up finding a good way to test his skills when I spotted some dromedaries eating our corn crops that were on the ground. So of course naturally I done anything any sane person would do. I made a firing line of all our soldiers and we just started letting them have it. These disgusting creatures hadn't come to buy any of our guns, but they were sure going to take some of our bullets if you catch my drift. A few hours later, Scott had finally returned home in the rifle runner with a lot of silver, chem fuel, things like that, but also quite a few guns. Looks like the rebels didn't have enough money to buy all of our products that we took. Some time after that, though, our radio terminal began buzzing and lighting up. It looks like it's picking up a global transmission. This is Greg Fulton, your host of Rebel Radio, and today we've got some great news as President Tree has announced that she'll be cracking down on the Impis slave trade in the Noquan Desert, in which she is calling it an Impis rights violation of gargantuan proportions. Hmm, well it would appear that we've actually lost the signal of the broadcast, but I think we get the gist. Looks like the rebels plan on cracking down on the illegal impid slave trade. I couldn't imagine that the president running for re-election very shortly would have anything to do with that. Regardless of rebel politics though, we would begin making some combat armor for our mercenaries. Just as well, we would also begin making them plenty of helmets. Now as I mentioned earlier, I am by no means happy that we were attacked by that martial 
little tank that was with the Mafia, but I will say that none of this would have been possible without the plasteel that we got from it. And by God almighty, look what we've managed to accomplish with those resources. Finally, a uniform that matches for all of our mercenaries, minus Shinichi. He does have a different helmet since he's the leader, of course. Just as well, Shinichi has a heavy variation of the combat armor. I also gave Ruland and Otto a sturdy variation of it as well, as I kind of see them as Shinichi's right-hand men. And of course, all the other mercenaries have the standard set of combat armor. The real difference between them, the sturdy and the heavy, obviously have much more protection. Then, since fall and winter is quickly approaching, I began working on some limestone planter boxes in our other growing zone under the mountain here. That way we can actually grow through winter. I think at some point I would like to make sure that it's all under the mountain because of the acidic smog and whatnot, but also because during raids our crops tend to get caught on fire and we end up losing a lot of them. Later on that night, as the sun had begun to set, I noticed yet another faction bombardment. This time, though, it looks like it's just outside the city of Antioch. No doubt another skirmish between the rebels and the marshals, of course, and the best part about it, it's right next to the road, so we could get there pretty quickly and pick up the pieces. But unfortunately, it looks like we're being raided first, so we're going to have to deal with that. Ah, if it isn't our old friends from the Confederacy of Bana, looks like they've actually sent out quite a large raiding party, with many of their members sporting some death squad armor. Nothing we haven't seen before, of course. Though I do see some armor with a medieval style flair to it as well. It looks like we may have some warriors from a few different tribes here. Very interesting. Uh, among their ranks as well appears to be a chieftain sporting some plasteel plate armor as well as two massive plasteel war hammers. No doubt he is a massive foe. We very quickly sprung into action trying to construct an anti-aircraft gun that would rain down the mortar shells that we have in storage upon their heads, but unfortunately they began attacking before we could finish it. As the massive group of Thromboians came to us, I noticed that their group had very little formation, showing that the chieftain most likely has very little experience. You see, Richard actually studied Thromboian formations of their war parties in uh, the academy and uh, uh, we're being attacked, never mind. Without any real formations, our enemies were beginning to scramble across our barricades and sandbags, many of them being killed and or incapacitated by our turrets before they could even get there. It appeared to me that they were extremely disorganized as many of them tried to stay behind and attack from a distance while others were coming right at us trying to throw firebombs at us as close as possible, resulting in a lot of friendly fire. Now I will say though this disorganization made it very hard for us to run them over. So I suppose that was something of an advantage they had. Realistically the only issue we had is when this handsome devil on the back of an ash shot his bow and arrow so fast at Shinichi he didn't have time to pull out his shield eventually leading to him hitting the ground but he was alive. Now now I'm making the battle sound much easier than it was. It was still incredibly easy though. At one point though we did have to take cover behind our geothermal generator and begin firing at them from back there. Eventually, we ended up killing enough of them that they actually began running away, and we would begin firing at them with the Sand Viper and our people as they were scattered, trying to flee. Among the cowards trying to flee the area was their chieftain. <laughs> you poor fool. Come back next time, you little demon, with a strategy and more men, and then we'll talk. Now, with the threat of being shot in the back with a bow and arrow is over with, we have the threat of starvation if we don't put out these damn fires. So that's exactly what we began doing. Also, also because, of course, we wanted some of the resources that they had dropped, like Jade and some of their shitty bow and arrows. And, of course, we were also trying to rescue Shinichi as well as Fox, our only two members to hit the ground as far as I'm aware. Now, I'll be honest, I was talking a lot of shit during the battle and I was very arrogant, acting like they didn't even make a scratch on us, but two of our members were severely injured, they also destroyed all of our turrets, and they almost destroyed our geothermal generator. Which is no bueno. I made sure to keep a good eye and oversee the medical treatment as best I could to ensure that nobody ended up bleeding out and to ensure if anyone got an infection we would take care of it quickly. Unfortunately though, I did notice a little bit of a health problem on Fox. It would appear that he ended up catching an arrow to the brain and he has a mangled scar that makes the spot itchy. 
Ouch. Well, that really sucks for Fox, and for us, because that means he's gonna be a terrible shot and whatnot, but, I mean, he's really one of the only mercenaries that we still have, so uh, we're gonna have to deal with it, I suppose. He's still an able body that can help us out uh, around the base and stuff like that, as well as in battles, even if he can't hit shit. Uh, speaking of helping out around the base, we're going to try to clean up the area, as well as begin repairing our turrets, and basically just kind of get back to business as usual. Or, at least that's what I thought was going to happen until late one evening we had a massive faction assault. This time around, however, it's not the usual suspects of one of the Thromboian tribes, the rebels, the marshals. No, this is actually the Mountain Devil Mafia, and it would also appear that the slavers from the Outlands are here as well. Not exactly sure what they would be fighting about, but these filthy bastards on either side could literally kill you for your golden tooth if you had one, so it's hard to say. I will say, though, if I were a betting man, I would put my silver down on Big Daddy and his massive group of attackers here. It would appear that he has a very large force mostly made up of impid slaves. I'm beginning to see why the rebels might want to crack down on this a little bit. Not that the gun empire is a bastion of freedom or anything like that, but I digress. Late into the night, the two massive groups decided that they would have it out. Unfortunately, they were going to have it out right slap dab in the middle of our base, so we decided to hide inside. We don't exactly have a dog in this fight, nor do we really care to own one. The only side that we could kind of root for was the slaver Big Daddy. But the way the rebels are talking, there's a possibility that he might not be around for too much longer anyhow, so there's really no point in trying to appease him. The dead have no use for any guns, and the rebels are probably going to be alive, still buying guns off of us at the end of the day, so that's how I made my decision not to help. I will say though, when it was all said and done, I was quite impressed that Big Daddy had seemingly wiped out the entire force that was accumulated by the Mountain Devil Mafia. Very impressive. However, this does mean that his ranks are thinned out just a little bit, making him even more susceptible to a rebel attack. But thankfully though, that was finally over with, but also unfortunately for the second time within the last 10 minutes of the video, we're going to have to play firefighter yet again, and also begin repairing our geothermal generator before it's destroyed. I also spotted this poor impid person lying there on the ground burning. Maybe we should provide some help to them. We could really do some good- you know, actually, I'd rather have this spear instead. Thank you. You know, actually, I suppose some good did come out of that massive faction assault, and it's another reason why I really like when those happen in our area. Unfortunately, of course, many things get damaged, but we end up getting a lot of different spears and guns and things like that. A lot of these groups, of course, carry makeshift weaponry and other things that are barely worth a cent, but those cents do add up eventually. Speaking of which, it's finally time for us to move on up in the world. We are going to have a nice lab here for Downs, of course, as I mentioned, and that does mean that we also need to build her a high-tech research bench. That way she can begin on some better research, such as the multi-analyzer, which of course doesn't really unlock anything in particular except the multi-analyzer that is going to be a prerequisite for many, many other research trees. But finally, now that things have calmed down just a little bit back at home and Downs is doing some research and everyone's safe and sound, we're actually going to send out Scott as well as a few of our mercenaries to the faction bombardment that's near Antioch. Because currently as it stands with the raid, the faction assault, and with this faction bombardment, we are going to really be accumulating quite the stockpile of weapons and I cannot wait for that and we can sell them and we're going to be rich as shit. The more we approached Antioch and the closer that we got, I realized that this faction bombardment is literally on the outskirts of the city. No, Oh, like I mean it, you can literally see the city. It looks like we made it just in time to catch the tail end of this battle, but this place was really going to hell in a handbasket and quick. The rebels were absolutely dominating the marshal service in this battle. Looks like all that equipment that we've been selling to them really seemed to pay off as well as the road that we built, making this city easily accessible to them. I did notice, however, as well, it looks like they're trying to stick to their promise of liberating the impids as there are many slaves rising against their masters in the city. Ah, truly beautiful, I suppose. Democracy and freedom at its best. Liberty for all. Finally, after hours upon hours of fighting, the rebels had finally won. The marshals were trying to flee further into the city. Even in some cases, just running straight into the desert, trying to get the hell away from the rebels as soon as possible. Naturally, of course, as one might imagine, the rebels were quickly giving chase to them. And I would like to reiterate once more that I really would like to take responsibility for how amazing the rocket platforms on the rebel 
tanks are. You're welcome. Who says Rat Knight can't change the world? Anyhow though, the city was burning, the dogs were burning, the rebels that were left behind as well as many of the martial soldiers were burning. Everything was on fire as you can see. Well, most of everything. Anyone that was not on fire was mangled in the streets next to a pile of bullets. Truly, the Marshal Service is going to have to step their game up if they expect to conquer this section of the city back. But the way things are looking, it looks like the Rebels are going to be pushing forward into Antioch. We very well may have to stop doing some trading here and begin trading with some other settlements, just in case. I suppose that's a decision we'll have to make once we see how things are going here at Antioch, but for the time being, now that the fires are kind of dying down and nobody's really going to notice, we started moving towards the city to try and scavenge any weapons that we could find what was left that the marshals didn't take with them or that the rebels haven't stolen themselves. Several hours later, once more as the sun was beginning to shine upon the mountains of Smuggler's Rock, we were pulling the rifle runner and the sand viper viciously into the garage, ever excited to dump our cargo. Now look, I'm going to be the first to say it, we made out with quite the haul this time around. Not in particular with weapons, though we actually did end up getting plenty of those as well. We actually ended up retrieving a holy shit ton of plasteel, which is very useful for armors and vehicles and many other different things. In particular, something it's been very useful for during this episode is the combat armor we've been making for our mercenaries, and hopefully in the future, of course, we have many more mercenaries to join us here. I believe next episode we're going to be doing a lot more trading with the rebels once again. I will say, though, I am kind of realizing that the trading with the marshals and the rebels, of course, it's kind of a fine line because these local settlements, of course, are at war, and if we do too much trading with one, as we've seen the marshals stomp the rebels in the one battle, uh, but now the rebels are beginning to try and take over an entire city with all the rocket platforms that we've been selling to them, so there is a very fine line that I think we're going to have to watch out for, and uh, we're going to have to be more careful. Um, I also believe that I would like to begin building some roads to other settlements uh, through the Marshal Service, as well as the Rebels, of course. One reason, of course, for that is because if we buy up all the components and stuff from one settlement, it's going to take a while for them to kind of uh, renew those and re rejuvenate those, I guess. Uh, so it'd be nice to have other options that are easily accessible to us, but also because if Antioch is at you know war right now, if they're in a massive battle, we're not really going to be able to do much trading with them. Uh, we're not going to be able to sneak past the rebels to trade to the marshals because that is going to be very risky if we were to get caught, right? That might turn one of the sides uh, onto us, of course. It's not something I want to risk, but we'll see how everything plays out in the next episode. Thank you guys ever so much for watching. I love you ever so much, and I will see you then. Goodbye.